In September 1905, visitors to the Bronx Zoo found a new exhibit. Standing in the corner of a cage in the monkey house was not an animal, but a young man dressed in a loincloth and carrying a bow and arrow. Later on, bones would be scattered about the bottom of the cage to add to the atmosphere. A sign was hung which read, The African Pygmy, Oda Benga, age 23, height 4 foot 11 inches, 103 pounds, brought from the Kasai River, Congo Free State, South Central Africa, by Dr. Samuel P. Werner, exhibited each afternoon in September. Oda Benga would be tormented for days in the Bronx Zoo, chased when he was allowed out of his cage or gawked at behind bars. While many of the details of his life are uncertain, what we do know of Oda Benga is that he was a man who suffered much at the hands of fellow men. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In the often contradictory reports of his life, it's unclear when Benga was born. Measuring from the 23 years given in 1906, he was born in 1883, but his age was reported inconsistently, with some suggesting that he was only 15 in 1906. No record exists of his birth, his family, or relatives, and it's not even clear what tribe he belonged to. He was often called a Bambuti, an ethnic group of Central African pygmy people from Central Africa in the northeastern part of the modern Democratic Republic of the Congo. All share a hunter-gatherer lifestyle and live in the rainforest of Central Africa. Whenever he was born, he was born into one of the worst examples of colonial exploitation in history. Belgian King Leopold II had secured Congo as his own personal land, and under a brutal regime forced the natives to supply goods such as rubber. Belgian officials led thousands of local Congolese as the force publique, which enforced rubber quotas by torturing and mutilating the indigenous people as official policy. Between killings, starvation, and sickness, millions of Congolese died between 1885 and 1908. Brutal killings were common, and it isn't known what kind of trauma Benga suffered in his early life. Benga first enters the written record in 1906, when he was found by Samuel Phillips Werner, a former missionary and aspiring adventurer and scientist. Werner had already been to Africa for a time as a missionary, but got sidetracked by his interest in African artifacts and locals, eventually being recalled in 1899. He returned to America with two orphan Congolese boys and a desire to become a renowned scientist and anthropologist. One of the boys died in 1902. Werner himself was prone to mental breakdowns with hallucinations and spent several stints in sanatoriums. He returned to Africa in 1904 on a mission from William John McGee, a prominent ethnologist who was organizing ethnographic exhibitions for the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exposition, commonly called the St. Louis World's Fair. McGee was preparing a number of exhibits using indigenous peoples, including Ainu from Japan, Native Americans, including the captured Geronimo, and African pygmies. Werner volunteered his expertise and was tasked with gathering 18 indigenous Central Africans as well as cultural items. After extensive preparation, Werner reported on March 20th, 1904, that the first pygmy has been secured. The man he secured was Oda Benga. Werner would eventually give many descriptions as to how he found Benga, but in his initial report he said that he found Benga held captive at a remote village and bought him for, with some salt and cloth. He was, however, known to be near Basongo, a noted slave market. It wasn't until a later report from Harper's Weekly that Werner first claimed to have rescued Benga from a tribe of cannibals, saying he was delighted to come with us. His stories quickly multiplied. He told the Columbus Dispatch that he had met Benga with some of his tribesmates from a nearby village and negotiated with the chief for Benga to join him. Yet another telling said that he had been captured by a rival tribe and then captured by Belgian forces, where Werner found him. At least one story claims Benga had a wife and two children who were killed either by Belgian forces or raided by another tribe. About the only constant in the many retellings by Werner and others were the presence of cannibals and that Werner was a savior. The exact circumstances around Benga and the eight other boys who joined him on his trip to the World Fair can't be known. Werner claimed that many had promised to come, but subsequently gave way to their fears, and only by giving them salt and guns could he convince anyone to come along. Endemic violence may have given them ample reason to wish for an escape, but Werner was also in a position to buy or otherwise threaten compliance as well. It took Werner another three months to get his charges to America, just in time for Werner to have another nervous breakdown. He checked into a sanatorium, and the boys, according to the manifest, the youngest was 12 and Oda Benga was 17, were sent along to the fair. They were sent two months late for the opening, but arrived near the end of June to considerable fanfare. 
Some 10,000 natives from around the world were exhibited in St. Louis, and even before the fair, officials had decided that any deaths among those exhibited would be kept for scientific study. The Smithsonian was to get, whenever possible, the brains of the deceased, while the rest of the body was distributed to other museums and institutions. The Africans were incredibly popular and quickly learned to perform for the crowds, shooting arrows and doing dances. Menga was especially popular in part because he charged a nickel to show his teeth, which had been chipped into points as a kind of cultural body modification. He was also heralded in the press as a little fellow who narrowly escaped being eaten by cannibals. Some reported that his teeth were sharpened specifically to eat flesh. Quickly, however, they tired of the attention because they were constantly poked and prodded, and their pets taunted and their privacy ignored. The fair officials were aware of their discomfort but did nothing about it. The Africans were also studied and measured, and scientists made plaster casts of their faces. By August 5th, when Werner finally reached the fair, they wanted to go home. At the end of the fair, each was given 15 cents for their participation. Werner was given the gold medal for anthropology. Geronimo was said to be particularly taken with Benga, to whom he gave an arrowhead. By the summer of 1905, Werner and his charges were back in the Congo. Werner claims during this period that he and Benga became friends and that Benga accompanied him on trips as he gathered more artifacts and sought minerals and other natural resources that Werner hoped to profit from. According to Werner, when he was prepared to return to the United States in 1906, Benga asked to accompany him. Again, the story was told in many different versions. In one, he said that Benga threatened to kill himself if Werner didn't take him with him. And in another, Werner said that he thought that Benga was simply going to be re-enslaved, and so he took him with him to protect him. But no account from Benga exists to explain why he returned to the United States. And it's quite possible that Werner merely saw the opportunity for profit. The pair, along with artifacts and two chimpanzees, arrived in New York in July. Werner went to the American Museum of Natural History, where he attempted to get employment and negotiated for Benga and the chimpanzees to remain with the museum director, Herman Bumpus. At first, Bumpus enjoyed having Benga at the museum, but soon began sending letters to Werner informing him that Benga was restless. He had attempted to escape the museum and had thrown a chair. Werner was having money problems. He was dodging an arrest warrant for a bad check, and eventually the artifacts left at the museum were all impounded. Fortunately for Bumpus, Werner arrived to take charge of Benga shortly after. He'd found Benga, a new home. On Saturday, September 8, 1906, the director of the New York Zoological Gardens, William Hornaday, directed visitors to what he said was his best attraction yet, caged in the primate house. Days earlier, Werner had asked Hornaday to house his chimpanzees and, of course, Oda Benga. Hornaday was ecstatic, and in an article published the next month, Hornaday described Benga as a well-developed little man who was quite pleased with his temporary quarters. He was an instant spectacle. The New York Times reported that the man who occasionally shared his cage with an orangutan was a bushman, one of a race that scientists do not rate high in the human scale. While it made some uncomfortable, the exhibit was approved by Hornaday, a well-respected zoologist, as well as the prestigious members of the zoo board. For New Yorkers, it was a cheap afternoon thrill. Admittance was free at the zoo five days a week. Hornaday pointed to earlier human exhibitions in Europe and claimed he was displayed only for scientific interest. He said Benga was only with the apes because that's the most comfortable place we could find for him and that it was one of the best rooms in the primate house. The press reported that he made mats to sell and did tricks with his bow and arrow, which he made himself. It was also reported that he was obsessed with money for photographs, which the papers thought he was going to use to buy a wife when he returned to Africa. He was also said to be fond of ice cream sodas. Later, Hornaday and others would claim Benga was employed at the zoo and that he stayed in the exhibits of his own free will. However, the working title for an article he wrote about Benga was an exhibition at the New York Zoological Gardens. Massive crowds seemed to vindicate his earlier excitement and Benga was moved to a different cage where keepers had spread bones out to capitalize on his cannibalism. Not all were happy about the exhibit. A group of black ministers were furious. We think we are worthy of being considered human beings with souls, said Reverend James Gordon. Benner claimed that Benga is absolutely free and that he was kept by the keepers for his own safety, as Benga was not fully responsible for his own acts. Another article said whoever put on the exhibit degrades himself as much as he does the African. Others met the Fuhrer with a surprising indifference. A New York Times op-ed brushed aside the idea that Benga should be educated as the idea that men are all much alike except as they are, have or had lacked opportunities for getting an education of books is now far out of date. While Benga's humanhood and freedom were battled out in the press, the zoo began seeking ways to make it less obvious that Benga was on display. 
The ministers appealed to the New York City mayor, who wouldn't see them, and Madison Grant, secretary of the Zoological Society, later a noted eugenicist and often quoted by Hitler, who brushed them off. Many papers defended Hornaday and Werner, who they insisted were victims of well-meaning but foolish protests. His every move was reported on daily and nationwide. In Los Angeles, a paper reported Benga could speak to orangutans. Reporters the world over wanted pictures, and one Frenchman even asked how much Benga was being sold for. Attendance at the park doubled compared to the same month a year earlier. Meanwhile, Benga grew tired of his captivity. He became combative, and Hornaday said he was hard to manage. Hornaday was confused when Benga refused to return to the monkey cage, and when he threatened to bite his keepers when they tried to force him. He remarked that Benga was an untamed ebony bunch of bother. Eight days after his initial unveiling, Benga was allowed to roam the park, but he was constantly swamped by hordes of visitors, howling, jeering, and yelling. Crowds were too much for the park keepers, and Benga struck a number of visitors as they chased him. Relentlessly pursued, he even shot one with his bow and arrow. On September 24th, he brandished a carving knife, and it took three keepers to disarm him. It was likely to everyone's relief when, in October, he was quietly removed and given to the care of Reverend Gordon's orphan asylum. Though Werner would offer to bring Benga back to Africa, Benga refused ever again to see the man who had taken him from his home. At the asylum, he learned to read and write and was sent to a farm to work. Eventually, he abandoned the program and sought to raise his own money, apparently hoping to book passage back to Africa on his own. In 1910, he moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, home to the Virginia Theological Seminary. It was reported that he would return to Africa as a missionary. He lived with a black family in Lynchburg and took some courses at the seminary. He became friends with Ann Spencer, a teacher who would later become a prominent poet of the Harlem Renaissance. In Lynchburg, he was called Oda Bingo, and his teeth were capped. Benga seems to have relatively enjoyed his time in Lynchburg, where he told local children about his home and how to spearfish. Sometimes they watched him dance and sing around a fire. Still, by 1916, after six years of trying to earn money to get home, he seems to have grown melancholy. He stopped playing with the children and spent hours alone under a tree singing, I believe I'll go home, Lordy. Won't you help me? It had been ten years since he'd last seen Africa. On March 19th, 1916, Benga was seen collecting wood. He started a fire that evening in a field near Mary Ellen's house, where he again danced and sang. That night, he entered a shed and retrieved a gun that he had hidden there. He shot himself through the heart. The Lynchburg News reported that, for a long time, the young man pined for his African relations and grew morose when he realized that such a trip was out of the question because of the lack of resources. He was buried at the city cemetery, surrounded by the family that he had found there. In the years that followed, everybody involved in the Oda Benga story went to defend themselves. Hornaday insisted that Oda Benga stayed in the park because he was well treated. Werner continually insisted that he was Oda Benga's friend and rescuer. And papers suggested that Oda Benga killed himself because he couldn't deal with the white man's magic and civilization. But we have very little record of what Oda Benga himself thought of his own life story. Whether he saw Werner as a friend or as a villain, why he returned to the United States a second time. What is clear is that Oda Benga was a victim of exploitation, depending upon the story possibly at the hands of fellow Africans, but certainly at the hands of the Belgians, of Werner, of Hornaday. Oda Benga's life story is distressingly lacking the voice of Oda Benga, and yet it still deserves to be remembered. And one of the things that we can do as historians is give voice to the voiceless. And in that legacy, offer a dignity that they might have been denied in life. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.